Thank you very much, Jakob, for that um, introduction. I'm very happy to be here and to be co-facilitating with Irene. I'm going to do a short introduction um, and just to, to put in the picture of, um, for our speaker. Uh, Dr. Lorenzo Dalbert is the head of ICT education at Rhodes University in Grahamstown, um, in South Africa, of course. Until recently, he was seconded to the School of Journalism and Media Studies as the MTM Chair of Media and Mobile Communication at the Associate Professor level. He worked as Research and ICT Coordinator in the African Language Studies section of the School of Languages and as Researcher in Multilingualism and ICT in the Computer Science Department at Rhodes. His areas of academic interest include new media and communication theory, mobile and ICT for rural development, hyperlocal media and services, mobile communication and disability and localization in African languages. He is involved in various ICT for development initiatives and international collaborations with partners in Europe and Southern Africa. Professor Dalvit authored and co-authored over 50 peer-reviewed publications and has supervised more than 30 students across various disciplines, including media studies, education, African languages, computer science. He made more than 100 contributions to local and international conferences and participated in the organization of more than 20 local as well as international events. He is a rated NRF researcher and has attracted additional funding from the NRF as well as the Departments of Basic Education and of Communication IREX and the European Commission. It gives me great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Dalbert to present to us on rethinking potential for MOOC uptake and employment opportunities. So I'm going to hand over to him. In the meantime, Irene and myself will manage the text chat, so if there are any questions that, that come up, we will um, take note of them and we will then revert the questions um, to Dr. Dalvit um, after his presentation. Okay, very good. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody. So uh, today we are going to talk about MOOCs, uh, Massive Open Online uh, Courses. And uh, these are the, obviously online uh, learning materials. Uh, they are generally, uh, but not always, uh, free and open. And the question is whether they represent uh, an interesting opportunity for Africa in general, South Africa in particular. And uh, the focus for today is on uh, uh, employability, really. Employability mainly of young people. They will be presenting the results of a study conducted uh, within the Advancing MOOCs for Development Initiative. This is an IREX sponsored initiative, so um, uh, coordinated from the United States uh, and in particular by the Technology and Social Change Group at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, they coordinated a consortium of researchers in South Africa, in Colombia and in the Philippines to try and get uh, a broad perspective on the potential of MOOCs for development in uh, developing countries. In South Africa in particular, a unemployment rate is at a very high rate. Uh, youth unemployment can be estimated to be at around 40%. We also have a huge problem with dropout rates, uh, both at lower levels of education and uh, at higher levels. So at university, approximately, approximately only one in three students actually completes their university career in the allocated time. And, uh, and then we have, generally speaking, uh, relatively low levels of uh, English and ICT proficiency among the broader population. So, the survey um, actually had uh, three components. Uh, the first was uh, a, a very wide survey, the first of its kind in South Africa. Very wide survey conducted uh, uh, through online means mainly and uh, also complemented by face-to-face. Uh, interviews and, uh, well, let's say, face-to-face uh, -face questionnaire administration. The second component was a focus group with MOOC users 
and the third was uh, uh, a series of key informant interviews. All right, at this point I need to check with my research assistant if I'm on the right uh, slide because I'm visually impaired and, uh, and so I have a person with me uh, helping me to read the presentation. So I'm in the right. Uh, okay, in terms of the online survey, uh, the original target was a thousand respondents, 500 actual and 500 potential users of MOOCs. So we wanted to look at uh, a very wide, broad sample and not only focus on people who actually use MOOCs, but also people who, uh, who could use them and could be interested. Uh, people who are online, uh, people who have some level of tertiary education, ideally, uh, and who have definitely completed matric. So we were looking at a particular type of person. And uh, our starting assumption was that uh, uh, MOOCs uh, are not as widespread. The use of MOOCs is not as widespread as it could be. And that's why I've included potential users. The uh, survey, as I mentioned, was administered online through email, mailing lists, uh, uh, social networks, etc. And was also administered by field workers, going around with tablets, contacting actual and potential users, and uh, filling in the responses on the tablet. And uh, broadly speaking, the scope of the survey uh, included some uh, background questions, as well as uh, uh, awareness, actual use, challenges, motivations, interested, interest in relation to MOOCs. The potential users. Uh, we actually found uh, 669 respondents, so above our original target. And uh, these were mainly contacted through the online survey. Uh, so people who received the link and uh, clicked on it and filled in the form online, uh, relatively easy to find and to, uh, to, to contact these people. And uh, uh, being potential users, we focused on awareness mainly, uh, how much did they know, have they heard about MOOCs before? Uh, if not, we wanted to know about uh, other related, potentially interesting e-learning experiences they might have had, or uh, their uh, beliefs, opinions, uh, interests, uh, motivations, etc. The actual users, uh, these are people who actually did use MOOCs. We managed to find only 269 of them, so below the target. The target was 500. We tried several strategies, uh, so for instance we had field workers uh, with tablets trying to contact, uh, trying to find people who had actually used MOOCs and uh, filling in the survey on the tablet face to face, in person. But we found it very difficult to uh, identify MOOC users and I will speak about that uh, uh, towards the end of the presentation, the methodological aspects some reflections on the methodological aspects. The focus here was uh, on uh, actual use, the experiences, uh, again the interest, the limitation and challenges that uh, MOOC users found and uh, uh, we also had uh, some of these actual users take part in a focus group. Very well, the next slide about demographic composition of our sample, uh, we found uh, a couple of interesting things. First of all, the fact that uh, female respondents seem to be overrepresented, uh, a ratio of two to one, so significantly overrepresented. Secondly, in terms of age, uh, our target was explicitly young people between uh, the age of 18 and 35. But uh, we found that we had to allow older people to fill in the survey for actual users as well. Uh, this uh, was uh, 
based on a suggestion by a monk practitioner. Uh, and uh, we actually found that uh, a number of the respondents would fall out of the initial target. So we found people older than 35 uh, were using MOOCs. And then in our sample we found that uh, at least half of the sample had uh, uh, some vocational training. Another uh, interesting finding because we explicitly targeted university students and uh, tertiary level students. So our uh, sampling strategy uh, was biased in that respect. So it's interesting that half of the respondents had vocational training and not a university degree. Mm -hmm. Great. In terms of access, how people access uh, MOOCs, uh, we, um, um, we found that not surprisingly half of the sample reported their ICT skills as average, uh, that is uh, to be expected. Uh, most people accessed MOOCs through mobile phones overall and access the internet through mobile phones. Uh, this is uh, um, consistent with other research conducted in South Africa and uh, in the developing world in general and has some implications in terms of uh, MOOC use. And then uh, I will need help with the last point. Yes, uh, internet access, uh, broadband uh, connectivity, the cost of data, uh, etc. Uh, came up uh, uh, as a determinant. And this issue emerged again in the focus group and in, in the interviews as well. So it's a recurring issue. We have a graph comparing users and non-users, so actual and potential MOOC users. And we immediately see that the type of device they use is different. So users, so actual MOOC users, uh, they tend to use more uh, uh, laptops and portable computers. Instead, non-users, so potential MOOC users, uh, we see that mobile phones and mobile devices are actually very uh, prominent, prominently used. Right, in terms of uh, MOOC, uh, MOOC use, uh, an interesting finding is that people who do use MOOCs, uh, so actual MOOC users, uh, at least 36% of them took more than one. This is quite a high percentage. Uh, a significant proportion took uh, five or more. So it seems like we have uh, a particular type of MOOC user who, um, uh, who takes a series of courses. So it's not just a once-off experience for one particular topic, but it's something that a certain type of person does uh, uh, over and over again. So uh, a, a continuous uh, trajectory. The second thing that actual users mention is uh, problems with uh, internet connectivity, the cost, uh, the broadband, uh, the quality, etc. And uh, uh, the third issue that I mentioned, actual users, is lack of time. So uh, when asked uh, what would stop them or what stopped them uh, from uh, taking MOOCs, uh, lack of time time constraints were again the, uh, were at the top of the list. And this is interesting because one of the strong points of MOOCs compared to uh, other types of learning is precisely that uh, uh, they allowed for some flexibility, for uh, uh, managing time in a different way. Okay, in terms of MOOCs interest, so here we are talking mainly about potential users, people who might become MOOC users. 18%, only 18% of them knew about MOOCs. So a relatively small proportion, and this confirmed our initial assumption that uh, not many people in South Africa know about MOOCs and are aware of their potential. Second bullet, I need help. 
Yes, time constraints also came up. This was a general question about online learning. So if they uh, were to take an online course, what would, what would stop them? What would be the main challenge that they foresee? Time constraint also came up again. Yes, and then uh, in general, uh, they, uh, um, they indicated that they preferred in-person learning. Mind you, a lot of these respondents were actually university students, so they had experience of uh, traditional forms of learning at tertiary level, and that was always the term of comparison. All right. Okay, so we see the graph with uh, the, uh, um, the possible challenges. Taking MOOCs. Okay. All right, uh, both groups, uh, actual and potential users, they, uh, they were asked to indicate what type of areas, what type of subjects they would be interested in. And the examples that came up, um, they uh, point towards different reasons and different interests. So for instance, a number of them uh, indicated uh, that they would be interested in MOOCs in computer science or, or that they took MOOCs in computer science. And this, uh, I think, is, uh, um, uh, can be attributed to the fact that this is an online form of learning. So the fact that uh, computer science students or people interested in coding, software engineering, would naturally be uh, open to the possibility of online learning. Another strong subject was uh, business management, uh, business administration. And uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, triangulation with other methods, uh, key informant interviews and focus groups, suggest that uh, uh, this was seen as a form of complementary in-service learning. So people who already had a business, who were already working, they took MOOCs to try and complement what they were doing uh, and improve their practice while at work. So not to find employment, not to address the challenge of employability, but to become better at their job, at what they were already doing. And then we found particularly among potential users an interest, a personal interest in learning languages and uh, using online resources for that purpose. All right. All right, the focus group, uh, we uh, had the focus group discussion with five actual users, so people who had experience taking MOOCs, uh, three females and two males. We met them in a central location in Johannesburg, so easy to, uh, um, uh, to organize and to find people and to organize transport for them to come there. And the focus was uh, on their personal stories and their actual lived experience of taking notes. Some highlights from this. Um, first of all, uh, they uh, confirmed a strong interest and strong uh, motivation to take MOOCs and uh, they all said that they would be keen to take more MOOCs. So once they started, they found it interesting, they found it valuable, and they wanted to continue. Note that this confirms what we found in the survey about uh, HL MOOC users. The second point, yes, again, they compared it to their experience with in-person learning. Um, and uh, for instance, one of the things that I mentioned is that in-person learning uh, prevents you from uh, um, slacking and from uh, uh, just leaving the course and dropping out. So that was one of the strong points that I emphasized. Uh, the danger with MOOCs is that uh, a person starts and then life comes in the way and they drop the course. The limitations that they identified. First and foremost was lack of awareness at different level. First of all, they noted that uh, uh, there is not much talk about MOOCs in the media, so they didn't really uh, found uh, any advertisement, any 
mention of MOOCs in mainstream media. It mainly came through personal contact, uh, online searches, etc. At the personal level, they, they claimed not to know anybody who was taking a MOOC. So a very individual, personal experience and uh, um, a no sense of a community and a structured uh, experience. Uh, this applied to these particular respondents. Uh, there are clearly some initiatives, there are uh, clearly some examples of uh, interest groups uh, of people taking a MOOC, but uh, these respondents were not part of these initiatives. And then also a lack of awareness on the part of uh, potential employers. Uh, this was uh, a belief, really, not necessarily based on personal experience, but the perception that an employer would not know what MOOCs are, and the fear that if they put MOOCs in their curriculum as part of their education, an employer would assume that that was the main qualification that they had, that they had nothing else, nothing better to show for. So, potentially a negative effect of including MOOCs in one's curriculum. All right, another limitation, uh, again, uh, internet connectivity, uh, broadband connectivity. Uh, these respondents came from different backgrounds. Uh, and they all pointed to the limitation of uh, uh, high cost of data in South Africa and uh, uh, problems with bandwidth. And then, uh, uh, yeah, related to that, uh, the difficulty of uh, uh, being connected and the complexity of uh, using MOOCs. So complexity of the interface, uh, and uh, complexity and difficulty in actually finding the right MOOC for them. All right, one of the suggestions was uh, perhaps to make MOOCs available offline. So not depending on the internet connection, but the possibility of downloading the material on one's phone or computer and being able to access it uh, in their own time and uh, uh, on the actual device. Uh, very good. Key informant interviews. We had uh, uh, 10 uh, key informants, uh, four from academia, uh, from very different universities actually, so urban, rural, uh, historically advantaged and historically disadvantaged universities, and from a range of subjects, from the humanities to computer science. Uh, we had two NGO representatives and uh, uh, four potential employers. So people in uh, a managerial position uh, within organizations in government as well as industry. Uh, the interviews were conducted face-to-face uh, -face whenever possible or by a phone in some cases. And the focus was specifically on employability and uh, in the case of uh, higher education academics, um, the possibility to integrate MOOCs as part of higher education. And so, higher education respondents, they... Um, ah, okay, they were made from... Uh, well, they pointed out that MOOCs uh, um, uh, the MOOCs uh, initiatives in South Africa are led uh, by uh, UCT, uh, WITS, mainly, these are the pioneers, and uh, more traditional forms of e-learning uh, by UNISA. The fact that uh, um, uh, MOOCs seem to be valuable uh, in the mind of the respondents as career, guiding, career guidance tools. So as an opportunity for young people uh, before they undertake a university career to get an idea of what a particular subject is about, how it works, to, to try out things before they enroll within a formal education system. Uh, this seems to be the value more than uh, uh, complementing higher education 
or uh, even more so substituting higher education. And uh, the respondents also pointed towards the inertia of higher education system. It would be very difficult to convince colleagues to change the way they teach. It would be difficult to assess uh, performance in MOOCs uh, and get formal recognition for MOOC courses. Right, the next uh, uh, group of respondents were potential employers and NGO representatives. And uh, they, just one second. Yes, they pointed out that uh, formal qualifications are a requirement for positions and uh, particularly for government jobs. Uh, it would be very problematic to hire somebody who does not have the formal qualification. So it would open up to, uh, to issues within the organization, uh, not to have the actual degree from a recognized institution. They, uh, however, recognize that MOOCs can be an added value to formal education and formal qualifications, so an extra thing. And, uh, in fact, uh, industry employers uh, were taking MOOCs themselves and were encouraging employees to take MOOCs uh, for uh, personal interest as well as uh, uh, to improve the way they perform while at work. So, again, not for employment purposes, but uh, to become better in their job. And again, employers pointed out to a general lack of awareness, uh, not perceived lack of awareness. So the fear that uh, uh, other potential employers would not know about MOOCs. So the particular respondents, they were very much aware, in fact, surprisingly so, but uh, uh, they pointed out that not everybody uh, knows about MOOCs and is willing to recognize them and accept them. Okay, as I mentioned, some reflections on the methodology. So, the strong points, and I think the success factors, were, first of all, the fact that we had a strong centralized design, so very clear, uh, very standard in many respects, and very well established, a survey design, so a very thorough sampling strategy. For instance, we tried to target people in different provinces to have uh, an urban, rural representation, etc. Uh, the second success point was uh, to work with uh, a private company with a lot of experience in surveys, uh, freshly ground insights. And uh, uh, that collaboration proved very valuable uh, when we needed to employ field workers with tablets to actually contact potential, to actually contact actual users of MOOCs. And the third success factor was to have a combination of technical and social science expertise in the team. So uh, this was particularly valuable during the focus group. Uh, discussion so that we could relate to respondents from a variety of different backgrounds. The challenges that we encountered, uh, the survey was conducted uh, during the second half of 2015, so most campuses were on protests, uh, where uh, there were student protests, and that seriously hampered our uh, data collection, since university students were our main target. The second challenge that we encountered was to, was to motivate people to fill in an online survey. So we had to employ a standard practice of uh, a reward, uh, an iPad mini for one lucky respondent randomly chosen. And that made a big difference. And then the third uh, challenge we encountered was uh, Lack of collaboration among uh, MOOC practitioners in South Africa. So this is in itself an interesting finding. There are uh, pockets of excellence. Uh, there are uh, uh, groups and people who are pushing MOOCs uh, and interesting, innovative experiences. 
but uh, uh, there is very little collaboration and sometimes even very little knowledge and awareness of each other's work. So this was a problem when we were trying to identify actual MOOC users. All right, the conclusions from this survey. Well, first of all, the fact that uh, um, uh, the, the general impression is that uh, MOOCs are still very much uh, uh, in uh, affluent user phenomenon. Uh, this uh, did not emerge so much from the survey, but from uh, the fact that uh, uh, some of the, um, of the actual users were identified in a target that we did not expect. So mainly older people, uh, educated people, uh, people with the necessary flexibility, but also with the necessary level uh, of education to access MOOCs. Uh, people who were already employed. So uh, we found that uh, uh, HR users could mainly be found outside our initial target. And that challenged our initial assumption. The uh, second finding is uh, concerns the relationship between MOOCs and formal education. So the fact that uh, MOOCs were seen as uh, a possibility to complement ed formal education and definitely not substituted. And uh, uh, the third key finding was uh, a lack of recognition of MOOCs, uh, a perceived lack of recognition of MOOCs. So the people we interviewed and who filled in the survey and who took part in the focus groups were by definition people who were interested and open to the idea of MOOCs. But uh, the general sense is that uh, there is still very little awareness. Uh, we have seen in the survey um, only 18% of potential respondents. So people in that prime target group, only 18% of those uh, were aware of MOOCs. So there is still a lot of work that needs to be done to uh, spread awareness among the general public and among potential employers. Right, very good. Uh, some acknowledgements of the sponsors of this project, and then I'm very happy to take your questions. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Lorenzo Dalvi. Um, I think we addressed you as a doctor before, but we have since corrected our, our findings. Thank you so much for taking us through this session. Um, there are several, I'll go straight into the um, questions. There are several questions about um, uh, um, use of, of um, MOOCs for um, vocational tra trainees. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, Olofumi is wondering how uh, some of these courses are can then be converted because most of it is um, they do things, you know. <laughs> vocational training is uh, for doing things literally. So um, he's wondering how that how that was was done, um, mm -hmm. or how how that was was put in place. And then um, there's also um, I was wondering about the education level. Um, uh, did that the education level did that affect uh, who came for the MOOCs? Was that one of the things you looked at. Perhaps you could um, um, look into those first and we go on to the next one. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. So in terms of uh, vocation training, an interesting finding uh, was that uh, companies, some companies, uh, were actually designing and offering their own MOOCs internally to their employees. Again, this uh, points towards the use of MOOCs to improve the way people perform after they are employed, but not so much, uh, their, not so much contribution towards employability of young people and new graduates. And uh, yeah, and that's it. And these experiences uh, depended really on the company, on the uh, level of the employees, etc. But uh, this came out uh, 
in the key informant interviews and in the survey as well. So specific MOOCs for specific companies, specific group of employees within uh, a specific field. So I don't know if that uh, answers the question. And uh, uh, the second question was about the level of uh, education. And uh, we found that, uh, yes, uh, it is graduate people with higher level of education, uh, in a sense, people who are already educated, who take advantage of the MOOC opportunity at this stage. Um, uh, university students are typically very busy with their own studies and uh, uh, they do not seem to take advantage of MOOCs to complement what they are already doing. It seems like uh, the trend is to focus on one's formal education first, get a job, and then while on the job, use MOOCs to complement one's skill set, uh, improve their performance, etc. So this seems to be the, uh, the general orientation, rather than uh, uh, access MOOCs uh, as an alternative to formal education uh, in preparation for formal education uh, or while looking for a job. No, that does not seem to be, this is not what uh, our study tells us. Thank you, Irene. Another question. Um, Prof, I have two questions. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry, Irene. I've jumped in. I'll, I'll wait my turn. No, Yolanda, go on, please. Go on. Thank you. Is it my turn? Sorry, sorry. I'm I'm so excited because the text chat is really buzzing um, with a whole lot of ideas and, and questions. Um, just a question or co a comment linked to that, um, the previous question about in-service MOOCs as opposed to, you know, for entry into the market or the workplace. Um, yes. There was a comment, um, Olufemi uh, was saying that, um, you know, using MOOCs for CPD. So I was just um, thinking about the, you know, the possibility of, of making it um, involving the professions to make it, um, you know, compulsory or to use MOOCs, um, you know, in a kind of professional registration um, for that purpose. So that kind of links with the idea of how is it used um, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question was about. Um, the interest that was sparked by in the text chat by you mentioning the use of offline MOOCs. So Nicola was saying something. I think there were some other questions about you know uh, to to know a little bit more about um, you know how that is um, being used and how that came through um, in your research. Oh, oh. All right, very good. So the issue of uh, um, the first question, the issue of quality assurance and of assessment. This is one of the big uh, questions about MOOCs in general. So how would you ensure quality and how would you assess MOOCs performance? There are uh, uh, some strategies in place, like for instance, uh, the equivalent of participation certificates. So they, they, uh, how do they call them? Badges, right? For people who attended all the sessions, who did all the work. But uh, the real big problem from the point of view of potential employers as well as the point of view of accreditation for professional development is how do we assess this? How do we assess quality in an online course? And that uh, remains an open uh, uh, question, I think, uh, until we, um, we devise a strategy to ensure quality. A possibility could be to have um, which I think was part of the suggestion, the possibility would be to implement this uh, as a blended learning experience. So you have the MOOC component of a course and then you have uh, uh, more traditional face-to-face -face, uh, interaction and assessment. So perhaps a combination of the two might work. This would require obviously a alignment 
in terms of the content, the curriculum, uh, the topics covered, etc. That's great. And the, uh, the second, the offline, uh, the idea of having offline MOOCs, uh, this would be particularly interesting in a developmental context. It was one of the suggestions, really, by one of the participants in the focus group. And, uh, uh, and there the question would be how it would work uh, in practice, um, uh, because in general, uh, the idea is to create an online community, to uh, have online interactions. The big problem is that MOOCs are designed to depend on the internet. And uh, so it would require really a bit of rethinking of what MOOCs are and how they operate. And again, that would have to happen at the local level. So I think both these questions point towards the need to uh, localize and contextualize MOOCs. Uh, we have some institutions, notably UCT, but uh, also others, uh, developing their own MOOCs in the African context. Uh, that's very good, and perhaps in that process, these kind of questions should be factored in. Localization in terms of content, and uh, perhaps relation to quality assurance, and uh, localization in terms of the type of constraints people might face. So think about a course that can actually be uh, accessed meaningfully offline and then can be synchronized when the person has the opportunity to connect. Think about an internet cafe or a free Wi-Fi hotspot, etc. I hope that this, that this answers the question. Um, yes, of course. Um, thank you for, for the response there. Um, uh, we'll move forward with, uh, since we, we still have a, a bit of time, we can handle mm -hmm. quite a set of um, our questions there. Uh, Nicola is asking, how do global findings compare to uh, Tashka, um, Tashka uh, findings about uh, users <laughs> MOOC? Uh, affluent by South African standards means something different, uh, which he says they are mocking on phones. So how does that compare? Perhaps you could share with us. Yes. Um, uh, I would actually, hi Nicola, I would actually be happy to share the full TASCA report uh, with uh, a comprehensive overview of all the surveys. Uh, it is available online and uh, I can share the link with you. Uh, what we found is that uh, it was very difficult to compare uh, because uh, of the samples. Uh, as I mentioned, in South Africa we struggled to reach uh, the target sample of actual participants and that kind of skewed uh, our sample. This on top of the issue that uh, uh, Nicola already identified the fact that uh, the um, South African society uh, has a particular history and a particular stratification deriving from that. So what it means to be affluent here is not the same as uh, what it means in the Philippines and in Colombia. So I know this is always frustrating, but what we found is that it is uh, difficult to compare and it is uh, yeah, it's very uh, methodologically very complicated. So, uh, yes, I can send uh, the full report, but uh, perhaps uh, the best thing is to identify the peculiarities of each case and, uh, uh, and treat them as uh, separate case studies. Uh, uh,
Um, Yolanda, you had a question. Please proceed. I think um, she might have stepped out a little bit. Um, the question is, at the beginning, we saw that the um, time um, was the biggest constraint for, for, for the MOOC takers. Um, how did technology perform um, uh, compared to time? I know they say time was the biggest constraint, but how did technology compare um, to that? You mean uh, technological constraints? A uh, time constraints were the biggest challenge. So that seemed to be the big problem. And I think this points towards that uh, conclusion. The fact that MOOC actual users uh, were relatively affluent people. People who could access MOOCs to their computer, their laptop. You probably remember that graph. Uh, so they were those, they they were likely to belong to that portion of South African society which has access to landline uh, fixed line internet connectivity at home or at work or at university and, uh, and therefore for them uh, the big problem was time also remembering that uh, a lot of uh, MOOC actual users were already employed the ability to manage their time was the big issue. Technological uh, uh, constraints, so the cost of data, uh, the availability of broadband, uh, that came up in the focus group and in the key informant interviews and uh, among potential users. So probably that is what excludes people from using MOOCs and uh, uh, potentially is what excluded people from taking part in this survey as well. So not this survey was uh, administered mainly online and uh, that introduced a method methodological bias. The fact that uh, uh, only people who were already connected uh, were targeted. So uh, let me know if this answers your question or if you were thinking about other types of technical problems, like interface, uh, sound quality, etc. Uh, I can already tell you that uh, those type of problems were relatively minor. So the big problem was uh, time constraints and then access to the internet, broadband, etc. Those were the two big ones. Uh, the other problems were uh, yeah, relatively minor problems. Um, thank you for, for, for the response. I think um, Yolanda now is ready with it. Let's hear it. Go on, Yolanda. Hi, um, can anybody hear me? Uh, sorry, my sound just dropped there for a minute. I apologize for that silence. Um, the question that, that I'm seeing now is also coming through um, about the blend. 
Um, mm. You did mention in your presentation that face-to-face -face is helping a lot um, to prevent dropouts because students want to know that there's somebody on the other side. Um, mm -hmm. Then there was a question um, Blessing was asking, but um, you know, how is the MOOC different from offering CPD, for example, through workshops and seminars? So again, looking at the face-to-face -face versus um, the online MOOC. Um, so how could you ultimately blend it so that um, you know you you get the best best of, of both worlds? Um, you know, drawing on your research, but also perhaps from your um, your past experience. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, the way uh, it could work is to identify um, sections of the syllabus and the curriculum which are covered by existing MOOCs and, uh, uh, and exploit that and leverage that. So uh, one unit within or one topic within a particular course uh, can be covered uh, uh, through a MOOC, through online learning. And then face to face, um, uh, mm, well, you can complement that, uh, discuss it, uh, uh, reflect on it, etc. The reference model that I have in mind is actually the flipped, chap uh, flipped classroom approach. So the idea that you don't spend time in class covering content, but you cover that content somewhere else, in this case in a MOOC, and uh, uh, you spend classroom time uh, to develop a different set of skills, so discussion, critical, reflection, uh, etc. Mm. Uh, complementing the content. Uh, uh, so this, I think this is potentially an interesting opportunity that books have to offer to a more formal um, ways of communication. This would work in uh, uh, within relatively small groups, uh, clearly identified. So, for instance, within a university course, and I've come across some experiences of that, and uh, uh, within organizations. Uh, so, with your employees, uh, with students in a particular course, uh, people you know, uh, clear identification of which parts of the curriculum can be covered or the training can be covered to a MOOC and which parts instead need to be face to face. Thank you very much for that. That is really very interesting. Before before I hand over to Irene, I, I see in the chat um, very um, interesting comments, uh, you know, um, in terms of, you know, taking this forward. Um, yes. Olufemi was asking um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of questions, kind of practical questions, you know, at an institution, how do you um, put things in place to set up a MOOC, etc. So, um, you know, perhaps there are some questions that we could, we could, um, we could put forward to you to respond to after, um, after the presentation. I don't know whether Jakob would allow that, um, because I think there's, there, are, there are people that are quite, getting quite excited about the prospect of using MOOCs. Oh, very good. All right, so um, I think we have got four minutes left. I, I think I must hand over to Irene um, at this point, although there, there are really very interesting um, questions. Um, and um, we have a, quite a large group from the University of Joss also in, in one venue um, in, a, in, a, in a meeting in a, in a room. So yes, and they will send us a photograph uh, to show us what, what, you know, who the group is. So yeah, there's, there's a big big group at the moment of 17 participants and, and everybody very active in the chat. All right, yeah. Irene, I'm going to hand over to you um, uh, so we, we keep to the time. Thank you very much from my side. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Professor Lorenzo mm -hmm. David, um, uh, for, for this wonderful, wonderful session. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate your assistant who was there with you too. Um, um, uh, I know that the, the people work back there usually um, uh, do sometimes a lot of work that we don't recognize. So we appreciate her too that um, you, you're there. Uh, this is um, the fourth webinar in this series of MOOCs.
So we hope that we shall continue. Thank you everybody who has joined us today from all different uh, uh, parts of Africa. Um, thank you for the people from JOS um, um, for joining us. Uh, I appreciate um, the Emerge Africa team, um, Jacob, Catherine, Tony, Nicola, everybody is here, Jerome, um, Alice, uh, everybody. Um, and thank you, Yolanda, for being um, uh, uh, my co-facilitator for this. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, it's amazing how technology works. And thank you. We, we are, will be continuing the conversation in our Facebook uh, page. Uh, we shall also be sharing the recordings um, as soon as we are finished. Uh, yes, the, the, the link has been shared by Tony. Thank you, Tony. And we shall uh, continue this in our uh, social media and also um, in the other places. Please uh, come again for the next um, um, webinar, which will be on Tuesday next week. And we look forward to seeing all of you there. Thank you so much. Over to Jacob.